Thanks, Amy. We would now like to collectively take a moment to acknowledge all indigenous and first people of the land and space in which we live and breathe. For our community at Highline College, we recognize that we are on occupied Duwamish, Coast Salish, Muckleshoot, and Puyallup lands. And we wanna thank all relations and tribes today as we prepare to hold space as a community. We recognize that all of us are joining this conversation from different areas. So we also want to invite you to reflect and thank indigenous and first people of the land and spaces in which you're coming from. Thank you. Thank you, Bob, for grounding us this morning. I now have the honor of introducing our presenters for today's session, A History of HIV and AIDS in Seattle. Pat Niglior, she, her pronouns, helped found both the BAVES Network and the now National Organization of Positive Women's Network. She has taught in Seattle schools and youth services for many years and currently teaches HIV AIDS education to grades five through 12 and at local colleges. Jason Plourd, he, him pronouns, has worked for LGBTQ community organizations for over 20 years. Prior to his role as project manager for the AIDS Memorial Pathway, he served as programming director and then executive director of the nonprofit $3 Bill Cinema. Fred Swanson, he, him pronouns, has been executive director of Gay City, Seattle's LGBTQ Center for 20 years. He's also on the Human Services Commission in Burien and active with Highline Public Schools, serving on both the Family Action Council and the Advisory Committee for Instruction on Race and Identity. Please join me in welcoming Pat, Jason, and Fred to our virtual stage. Thanks so much, Amy. Um, we are really happy to be here. Um, and so we're going to be spending the next yeah, 45 minutes or so with you. Um, and we have a slide presentation to guide us, um, uh, but we'll probably be doing a lot of talking um, uh, as well as looking at the slides. The way that we have uh, the program set up today, next slide, um, you'll see each of us um, who have already been introduced uh, will have a different section. And so we're gonna start with Pat talking about uh, the early days of the AIDS crisis uh, in the 80s, and also talking some about the work that she did in organizing uh, support for women living with HIV. And then we'll shift over to me and I'll talk a little bit about the 90s, uh, both the early 90s uh, when I was working in Chicago at Howard Brown Health Center, which is uh, an LGBTQ health center in Chicago. And then uh, uh, later in the 90s, after Gay City, the organization where I've been working for 20 years was founded, and talk a little bit about Gay City and the work that we do. And then we'll shift to Jason, who will talk about uh, the AIDS Memorial Pathway and how that came together and how it uh, is a reflection on the history of HIV and AIDS in Seattle. So that's kind of what we'll be doing and what we'll be walking through together. So next slide. So we're going to start with Pat, so I'll hand it over to you. Thank you, Fred. Um, good morning, everybody. Nice to be with you all. Um, am I? Yes, okay, I am unmuted. I hate to be brilliant and be muted at the same time. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the early epidemic looked like, and I'll start with how I kind of stepped into um, the, the AIDS universe, uh, and I found out that I was HIV positive way back in 1986. Um, I was married, my husband's name was Bob, and he found out before I did that he was positive, and he found out because he had, um, he had donated blood, and that was the beginning of 85, they started to test the blood supply. And so he was one of the, I think there were 11 people who had been blood donors who, um, who had turned up positive. And so then I had to go and test and I went to lovely Harborview Hospital to the STD clinic. And I was very um, incredibly nervous, of course. And I just, I didn't know much of anything about HIV. Um, I had actually taught sex education in classes uh, previous to that, but that was 
pre-HIV. Yes, there was a time before AIDS. I know that that's hard to believe. Um, so I went in and the, the, the test counselor was great. And she, you know, she prepared me. And then there was a week to wait between getting the test and getting the results. And when I went in to get my results, she just said, well, I'm not gonna beat around the bush, you're positive. And that was kind of the beginning of the journey. Um, so I didn't know anything about HIV. And so of course, you know, knowledge, power, all that, we tried to find out as much as we could about HIV. And in doing that, we um, oh, read as much as we could find. And there was, I remember going to the library in, in Burien and trying to find anything. It was back in the days when there was a card catalog. I remember looking through the card catalog and finding everything that had to do with HIV and then gathering it all up and hiding out in the corner between the stacks so that nobody could see what I was looking at. And what I learned that day and was pretty much you get HIV, you get AIDS and you die. And that was 1986. So um, it was a matter of trying to find a doctor and trying to figure out who to tell and what was um, appropriate to tell because we all knew that at that time there was tremendous, and there still is tremendous stigma about HIV. And there were people who were losing their jobs and losing their friends. When they, made, when they came out, sometimes they would lose their friends, family, jobs, communities of faith. Um, roommates would walk out, it would be, or, or actually kick the person out usually. So it was necessary that, that people were really discreet. Um, now, we were pretty discreet. I certainly know folks who weren't and who told everybody right away that they got their test results and they were positive. And um, they didn't have very much time to settle into the results before they uh, just told everybody. We told nobody. <laughs> um, eventually we told a couple of friends and that was enough. Um, but then I started to look for a support group. And I called up Seattle AIDS Support Group and I asked when the heterosexual support group met, silence. And I said, well, is there a women's support group? More silence. Um, I said, well, what, what can you, you know, what's going on at Seattle AIDS Support Group? And I was told that there were support groups and there was not one in particular for women, but they did have a woman or two that would come to their regular groups, which of course were all men. Um, Bob and I went to a support group where of course I was the only woman and I learned a lot from the guys in that group. Um, we had, um, after the official group ended, we continued to get together socially and we, we would talk about the things that we'd been reading because everybody, we were all reading about HIV to try to find out what was going on. And this was before there was any medication available. And so we would, the, there were alternative types of medication available. And when I say that goes all the way from, you know, really good alternative medic, medicine, naturopathic medicine, all the way to snake oil out of the back of somebody's truck. And people were just grasping at straws, trying to find anything that they could to take to try to slow down HIV. Um, there was a lot of fear. People were afraid of us. And when I say us, I mean people with HIV, which is part of the reason we didn't wanna tell our status. Um, I realized then after going to that support group and becoming more involved at Seattle AIDS support group, that if there was gonna be a group for women that I better get going and start it. So I found a couple of other women with HIV and we had been talking to like the test counselor and the social workers at Harborview and they referred women periodically to the group of us. Um, and we started an organization that became the BABES Network. And BABES does not stand for anything in particular. It was when we were getting together at one of the co-founders houses and we were having um, a bring your favorite takeout potluck. And we were talking about our lives and one woman, and of course it, the discussion turned to sex and one woman stood up and, uh, and people were lamenting not being able to have sex anymore, which 
you know, is wasn't really factual, but that's the way people felt. That's the way the women felt. One woman can um, stood up and she put her hands on her hips and she said, I was a babe before AIDS and I am still a babe. So uh, that's kind of how we got the name. And this was, I know it's hard to believe again, this was pre-internet. So um, once we got a website, it became much more interesting um, to find out <laughs> the other organizations that had the word babes in it. Um, usually it would get flagged if we went on the computer and, and got, got found out. So we were a standalone organization for a number of years. Um, and then when uh, it, it became pretty clear that we were gonna lose funding, um, a lot of funding, not all, but a lot. We became part of the YWCA, which is where we are still located downtown, uh, first in Seneca and uh, fifth in Seneca, excuse me. So the, the atmosphere then was, um, there was one big AIDS organization in town and lots of little ones. The big one was called Northwest AIDS Foundation, NWAF, NWAF. And they were uh, kind of the, they had the national recognition and they had the budgets. And uh, so they were, they took on doing case management um, for people with HIV. And from then back, case manage, okay, I'm, Sorry, I just had a call come in. Um, they took in the case manage managers. Their job wasn't just to manage the person's case. It often was to take their client to the grocery store, to go to, um, certainly to go to the doctor's appointments with them and be at their memorial services and speak at the memorial services because there was a tremendous amount of death happening. Um, that a very original group that I belong to, I'm the only survivor from it. Um, Bob got sick, he got, um, and he had to leave his job, um, which, was, which meant that we had to start making explanations about HIV, and, and what, mainly because we had to explain why Bob left his job. And so we started telling people, and some people understood and continued to be our friends and some people dropped us and said they ne never to come around them or their children again um so it was it was it was a mixed bag and some people really just didn't know how to act and what they did is they just kind of receded and kind of ghosted us um so family was another issue uh, that which was a huge issue back then um I know it still is now, but back then it was, um, everybody made the assumption that if you were gay, you had HIV, or if you had HIV, you must be gay. And so it was kind of, we were, um, nobody believed that women could get it or well, they, and that people, um, yeah, it was a pretty, pretty closed environment for trying to come out and for support. And people say all kinds of most interesting or uninteresting things then. Um, and our favorite question is always, but how did you get it? Sex, we got it through sex. Um, but we never told, I never told my mother. We told Bob's parents um, and Bob died in 1989. He had been part of the early um, AZT trials and that was the first medication that was approved to fight HIV. It had some, um, some people had some really bad side effects from it because it was being given in a very large dose. Um, and, you know, we were just trying to find our way back then. Kind of in the, the overall picture, as I said, Northwest AIDS Foundation was the big guy on the block. Uh, the health department was very involved um, and was basically in charge of whatever federal money came into the state of Washington and how that was distributed to different agencies. Um, Bob Wood, Dr. Bob Wood is kind of a legend in Seattle AIDSville. He was, uh, he, well, he's still alive and he uh, was head of the Seattle King County Public Health HIV AIDS division. And um, he got, we, we did many projects together and 
he was always on the go-to list whenever there was a story about HIV. And we would sometimes have to hold our breath because we weren't sure what Bob was gonna say, but Bob Wood that is. Um, my, probably the hardest part for me was all the deaths. And that meant um, lots of funerals at all times and lots of, um, you know, we, we got used to going to funerals every, every week, sometimes a couple few in, in the same week. Uh, we got to be, you know, when I say we, it was, you know, the friends I had with HIV, um, and we got to be quite the connoisseurs of where there was a good place to have a funeral. <laughs> so um, we'd be talking about where to, where to conduct the service and people would say, oh, well, let's see. I know that Leffler House charges this much and the <laughs> aquarium charges this much. So it was kind of funny because we became somewhat of party planners as well. Um, Bob's memorial was at the, uh, um, at the Arboretum. <laughs> and, and there were all kinds. And, and at that time I used to talk about, and I think it's still somewhat true now, of uh, the funeral of a person who died of HIV, who died of AIDS. And the people who might have been there to take care of them throughout his illness, I'm saying him in this case, uh, were probably his partner and a group of friends, many of whom were gay and lesbian. Um, and what happened when the parents stepped in, when the family stepped in, was very often at the end of their, that person's life, the family would kick out because they didn't approve of his um this guy's friends would kick them out and they would be sitting at at the back of the church so those were my back of the church people who were usually the folks who were doing the most caregiving for folks with hiv um, and if the family didn't like them they could because there was no marriage and so there was no people had no um there was no recourse. You had to, it was family that was next to kin. So um, other organizations popped up. It was kind of like Northwest AIDS Foundation had a number of different organizations under them that they helped to fund. And they ranged from organizations like In Touch, which was a massage, their massage therapist who gave free massages to people with HIV. And that was an important aspect because so many people were just afraid to touch us. Um, and so that was that was very nurturing. It was it was very comfortable and it felt good, but it also reassured us that there were people who were willing to touch us without freaking out. Uh, there was an organization called Volunteers Attorneys for people with AIDS. There was a pet project. Um, there there were just there were lots of different smaller organizations uh, that eventually tended to get absorbed by. Northwest AIDS Foundation, uh, which later became Lifelong AIDS Foundation. No, it became Lifelong, yeah, it was Lifelong AIDS. Um, and then it became, um, it's just Lifelong now. So I think they're trying to get away from their simple, their just being for people with HIV. A big organization that was around in the early days was what one called uh, Chicken Soup Brigade. And that was to bring food and uh, comfort to folks. And the, so it was making meals and bringing food to folks who, who were pretty much homebound. Um, and they also provided a lot of emotional support because they'd come to your house to bring food. Uh, Shanti was a, a very big organization that was a one-on-one -on -one, um, organization. And there, there really was a need for all of these organizations. And what what's interesting and unique is that they were founded by community members who were personally impacted by HIV. Um, they were, people had real stories about how these organizations started. Unfortunately, over the long run, um, these organizations couldn't all be standalone organizations because it was too expensive. So many of them kind of got absorbed, like kind of, um, uh, became like a little um, portion of lifelong or they, um, many of the organizations are no longer around. Oh, there's still what is around, but 
that's important to know about is P, um, is POCAN, sorry, I almost said PCAF, but POCAN, which is People of Color Against AIDS Network, uh, was has been the primary lead throughout the years uh, of doing the, um, of making sure that the, that the care and stories of people of color were getting out there. And it wasn't just, sorry guys, it wasn't just gay white men whose stories were out there because that was pretty much the emphasis at the beginning of the uh, epidemic. I'm still around 37 years later and I'm around because I have medications to take. Um, I have, I'm repartnered and so I'm, so my, my life is going pretty well. And, um, and I had no idea that I would be alive this long. Uh, so I blew all my savings a long, long time ago, as many of us did. So um, I think that that's probably a good start and I'd like to hand it back to Fred. Thank you. Thanks so much, Pat. Um, so we'll go back to the, the slideshow I was gonna say in a minute. Um, I was gonna pick it up there where, um, where Pat left off uh, with this idea of people um, uh, kind of going through their savings. And one of the things that happened, I guess I'm gonna go back for just a second and um, talk a little bit about COVID. And so a year and a half ago or whenever this started two years ago, I, I guess almost, um, one of the questions that came to me a lot and a lot of reporters called and, and were asking, you know, how is this different than the early days of AIDS? Uh, is this like uh, the beginning of AIDS where there's this kind of pandemic and no one knows what's going on? And, you know, what's so interesting and, and what I uh, talked a lot about at that time with reporters and I think heard a lot from other people who lived through uh, the early uh, AIDS epidemic was that the, the biggest difference was uh, we had every system working to try to fight COVID, to try to mobilize against COVID, to do something about COVID. And it was not that way at all with AIDS. Um, if anything, you know, Ronald Reagan was president. Uh, he made jokes with his cabinet about AIDS. Um, it was viewed as uh, something that um, gay men deserved, um, a way that you know, kind of solved a problem that existed um, of, of gay men uh, living their lives. And, and so I think the biggest difference, while there were some similarities with the nobody knowing what was going on and lots of confusion, um, the, the biggest difference was uh, that nobody cared. Uh, uh, and it was, you know, when Pat talks about all these organizations that started in community, the reason that they started was because uh, the government was not showing up. Nobody cared about uh, the people that were dying of AIDS. No one cared to uh, find uh, a way to test for AIDS. You know, the HIV test, uh, I don't think came out until 85 or 86. Um, you know, I mean, it was just that nobody, nobody cared. And so you had an entire generation of gay men who passed um, because of HIV and AIDS. And the only people who cared were our, uh, you know, our, our, our community members. And oftentimes we were rejected by our families. Um, so, I mean, it was really a, a dark, dark period of time. And, you know, to hear Pat, your story about, um, you know, and within that, so all of the stigma that was keeping uh, gay men from getting the support and help that they needed was then compounded by the fact that you weren't a gay man. And so you had all of that stigma, but then also this, you know, kind of, uh, you know, peculiarity uh, in, in the time of being, a, you know, a woman in a straight relationship, uh, uh, living with HIV and, and not having places for support or not having people uh, who recognize that. So, uh, you know, really, uh, I'm so glad that uh, you could share your story, Pat. And, and I think it's so important for people to really imagine what it was like in the 80s, where you were going to, you know, a different funeral every week, sometimes two funerals a week. The Seattle Gay News was just filled with names every week of all of the people dying. 
and uh, and just what a tragedy and what a you know what an awful time it was. So on the note of you know kind of people getting their lives together, um, uh, you know Pat, as you were saying, uh, many people in the '80s living with AIDS uh, knew that they were going to die, and so in order to get their lives together. Uh, there were biatical companies that would buy your, your life insurance. And so oftentimes people couldn't work anymore. So they would uh, no longer have income. They would sell their life insurance so they would have money to live on. Um, they would go through all of their life savings. And that's kind of, I guess, where I entered the picture in terms of my professional um, work around HIV was in the 90s. Um, and I was working in Chicago at Howard Brown Health Center, uh, which is the LGBT health center, uh, also a big HIV services provider in, in, uh, in Chicago. And the people that I worked with and the people that I, and, and at the time I was doing HIV testing and, and men's health work, and at the, the, the folks that I ended up befriending and, and, uh, and, and being in their lives uh, were all in that, that place of, um, you know, essentially preparing to die. And, um, and for those of us who came out in the 80s, there was this sense of not only, you know, were you kind of challenging your parents' assumptions about who you were or any of those things, but for many of us, and I'll just say for me personally, it was a, it was a decision uh, kind of to accept that you, that, that your death was inevitable, that, um, being gay was so associated with dying and so closely associated with HIV and AIDS, um, it was really hard to imagine uh, that that wasn't going to be the inevitable, you know, kind of future. And, uh, and I was really convinced, you know, in spite of efforts to uh, make healthy choices and all of that stuff, that, that I would not last past 30. And I think many of us um, at that time just really, that, that was kind of what, what we thought was our future. And so, um, and around 95, um, combination therapy hit and it really changed everything uh, as, as it related to HIV. And so all of a sudden you had an actual effective treatment and, um, and so the outlook for people with HIV and the outlook for people with AIDS um, was really different. Um, and uh, what was interesting about that time, um, uh, a lot of the people that, I that, that were close to me um, had this odd experience of having prepared themselves to die and then having to actually metabolize or figure out the idea that they may actually live. And a lot of people didn't make it through that. Um, and I'll just speak specifically, uh, uh, a dear friend of mine, Lee Merrill, who moved in with me in Chicago, he, he was part of this back to work program that, uh, that many of many places, including Howard Brown where I work, set up because you had people who had been out of the workforce for a long time. And then all of a sudden, they were getting healthy again. And so it was like, okay, well, we need to retrain you for, uh, for jobs so you can get a job again and you can get back into the, the work field. And anyway, that's how I met him as a part of that program. And, um, you know, one of the things that was really rough um, uh, was this idea of how do I shift from, um, I'm, you know, I'm kind of ready and prepared and I've made peace with, saying goodbye and then all of a sudden um maybe that's not what's going to happen and you'd think that people would be overjoyed and they would be elated and i think you know a lot of people were and I, most people probably were um and also it was a really complex feeling and if you can imagine um just the inevitability of your departure and preparing for that and then all of a sudden um wait i what I have to like shift gears and maybe I'm gonna live and can I trust that? And how long will this medication last? I mean, it was all brand new. And so um, he, anyway, so, so Lee's what brought me to Seattle uh, because he was from Seattle and he moved back to Seattle. And so I came out here in, in, um, in 2001 um, 
uh, to take the job at Gay City. Gay City had been around since 1995, so we can go to the slides now. Um, uh, Gay City uh, uh, got started um, in the in the so the next slide, yeah. Um, in the mid, can we actually go to the next one? Um, got started in in '95, really in response uh, to yeah. There you go. Um, uh, to the idea of um, well, it's it's kind of a new era, and we need to uh, help build connections uh, between and among gay men uh, in this context of uh, we actually have a future. Um, we actually have lives that are valuable, and we need to figure out how to do that and how to live in healthy ways. Um, it was initially started really in response to, to lack of funding to support um, healthy community building among gay men. And so uh, we had these large community forums where we talked about issues that were impacting our lives. And it resulted in the, this organization that was essentially our, our first tagline was building a community stronger than HIV. It was really just intended to build those healthy connections. In, in the 2000s, um, uh, we added HIV testing. Um, before uh, 2004, uh, there was a, uh, an organization called the Seattle Gay Clinic that got started in the 70s doing uh, uh, testing for syphilis and gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, volunteers doing that out of country doc. That organization uh, lasted volunteer run the entire time until 2004, where they asked us to take on their work and we expanded then our HIV testing program. Um, and it was the first five day a week. And it's now uh, it, it evolved to six days a week uh, in English and Spanish HIV testing, STI screening. Um, also in the 2000s, several other organizations um, uh, came together uh, with Gay City. The old LGBTQ Center came to us um, asking us to take on their programs because they were shutting down. Um, and Verbena, which was the queer women's health organization, also shut down and we were able to take on some of their work. And so the 2000s for us, uh, that first decade was really about growth and, and lots of organizations kind of bringing their work to us as they, uh, as they shut down. Um, and then in 2012, we opened uh, our current space, uh, which was our first attempt to build an LGBTQ center um, that included uh, all of the wellness programming, the HIV services, as well as an arts program. Um, we have the largest collection of LGBTQ literature in, in the Pacific Northwest um, in, a, in a library, a lending library. Um, uh, and then we had a coffee shop and a variety of things. Uh, of course, COVID really um, put a damper on a lot of that. We had to shut down a lot of our programs. We shifted to uh, virtual uh, for helping people with health insurance and and resources and things, but we have been testing the entire time and also added a, a prep clinic. Um, we're opening a new center um, uh, early next year. And so we'll be growing, continuing to grow. Um, and then can we go back a slide? Sorry, I think they were in a different order than I, I imagined. Um, and so you can see now just who we are. Uh, uh, this is our mission. Gay, uh, Gay City cultivates access and connections to promote self-determination, liberation, and joy. Um, our values, advocacy, accessibility, intersectionality, sex and body positivity, stewardship, and transparency. And then our vision is that we are the definitive hub for LGBTQ individuals seeking affirming and responsive resources, wellness, and community. Um, a lot of the work that we've done over the past couple of years has been expanding our youth advocacy work uh, we are in Highline Public Schools and Seattle Public Schools um, and, and uh, do a lot of work um, supporting uh, young people. Uh, we have a diversion program with the, the, uh, the city attorney's office in Seattle um, to help young people avoid uh, prosecution. So a ton of stuff, um, really good work. Um, and then of course, we most recently were asked by the AMP to further their work. And so I'm gonna shift over to uh, Jason and maybe we can advance a couple slides and, and move to Jason's presentation on the AIDS Memorial Pathway. 
Thanks, Fred. Thanks, Pat. Um, yeah, in the time we have left, uh, I just want to talk a little bit about um, the uh, the AIDS Memorial Pathway and how and how that came to be. As as we've has been has been talked about, um, uh, there is a, a, a an important and um, wide-reaching history that that's happened in Seattle and King County and, and in the state of Washington around HIV and AIDS. And um, uh, Seattle being a, a second wave city, um, it wasn't hit immediately by HIV and AIDS a, a, as much as uh, New York, LA, and San Francisco were. And so the, the result of that was a lot of folks in public health and a lot of uh, communities Kind of saw what was happening and were able to prepare a little bit um, for uh, the pandemic uh, as it as it uh, hit the city, um, and uh, and in response, organizations that Pat mentioned uh, were, were formed. Uh, communities came together. Um, there was a, a general model formed, the Continuum of Care, which which was uh, organizations working together to provide um, support to identify folks, to help with testing, and, and for folks to know their status. And then once they were diagnosed, to to be able to provide uh, living support and um, you know care all the way through to hospice and uh, eventually when when folks passed. So. Um, so there was a lot that that happened, and that was some that was unique, and some that was just you know remarkable and 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 and, and borrowed uh, you know from other cities, and, and of course folks uh, I think Pat sort of mentioned too that had to deal with how their families responded, and some people moved to the city to um, to be with friends and not with biological family because of, of necessity. Some people moved from the city back to smaller towns to, to be with family in, in some situations. So, um, so anyway, there was a rich and complex history and, um, there's been attempts to sort of, uh, to, you know, make sure that we, we all remember that, um, in the mid nineties, uh, a city council member at the time, um, talked about there was there was an effort to create an AIDS memorial and it eventually it did not happen there's actually a, a, a short video on our website did not happen and uh, you know there's many reasons for that and there's um, uh, there's many reasons why people don't want to remember the history of HIV and AIDS there's folks from without uh, from outside the community uh, who are indifferent, who don't really care to remember. Um, and there's also folks within the communities, our communities, that um, that feel like it's too painful and, and, and you know, didn't want to revisit that. But um, so at the time in the 90s, it definitely was very, uh, like emotions were raw and it became difficult to, to make that happen. It wasn't until about 20 years later uh, in 2015 when um, folks, uh, came together again and realized that there's an important history here. We we don't we we cannot forget um, how AIDS and HIV has affected us, um, how folks have responded, and um, you know, in the end, and a reminder that it's not gone. Um, so there's this this idea that since you know that. The mid '90s, when therapies became more effective, and then in the, you know, in the into the 2000s, and more, most recently with with um, treatments like PrEP that that are preventative, um, that that uh, there's significant strides being made to reduce and um, combat HIV and AIDS, but it's not it's still with us, and um, that's an important thing to remember as well. So if we go to the next slide. Um, and I'm going to give a, a, I'm going to kind of go through these quickly, just in the in the interest of time. But um, we do have a website that I, I just want to mention. There's a website, the amp.org, um, a m p, or t h e a m p dot o r g, um, and uh, there's a there's a history of a, a general history around HIV and AIDS, but then there's also a history about the formation of the memorial that that you uh, can be viewed there as well. Um, but uh, the AIDS Memorial Pathway, this community group that started uh, with a, a city council member, uh, Tom Rasmussen, who was very supportive of this project and wanted, thought Seattle should, should be a site for an AIDS Memorial, um, 
uh, convened some community members and that grew into a community action group. Um, and over the last uh, six years, um, that group has made this memorial a reality. Um, so it was dedicated in June. Um, it's located on Capitol Hill. Um, so right above the light rail station in that plaza, um, in the community room of the station house, uh, the community with housing station house building, and then also um, uh, in the north edge of Calenderson Park. Heck stuff. So let's go to the next slide here. Um, being in Capitol Hill, of course, is really important because many of the organizations that, that Pat mentioned were based on Capitol Hill. It was the center of the, the queer community, um, especially in the, in the um, late 80s and 90s. And um, so it was uh, an area, it, it has a lot of meaningful connections uh, to, to the history of HIV and AIDS. So the goals set up by the, the community group were to use public art to create a physical place for remembrance and reflection, to share stories about the epidemic um, in the community responses, and then to stand as a call to action and a reminder um, that we still need to end HIV AIDS stigma and discrimination. Um, next slide. Uh, the artwork, as I mentioned, is, is in this location on Capitol Hill. Um, we're thrilled um, that it's right above the light rail station because it makes it accessible for folks to go to. One of the things that's unique about Seattle's Memorial is that it is in a, in a highly trafficked, invisible area of the city. It's in one of the densest neighborhoods of Seattle and not in a tucked away corner of the city or in a, in a small setting in a park. And so it's really putting um, the values and in, 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 uh, issues of the, of the AIDS memorial front and center and in, in, in accessible to a lot of folks. So, uh, and there's different emotional aspects. Um, what, that's one of the th other things I really love about this project is that we didn't want it to be very monolithic, though one of the artworks is called Monolith. Um, we wanted the, the memorial to have um, a, you know, diverse perspectives and then also to really connect with um, different emotional um, connections. There's, yes, there's sadness and grief, but then there's also um, the, the, the memory of folks that brought so much creativity and exciting things to, to our lives. And, and there's also the, the lessons of, of, of people stepping in and helping each other in this, you know, in the most dire uh, times uh, of crisis. So, um, so anyway, there's a lot to feel connected to. So next slide. Um, one of these pieces is in the community room, like I mentioned, in the Station House building. Um, it's, uh, it's not open all the time, and currently they're not uh, reserving um, the, the room because of COVID, um, but you can view it from the outside of the room. Uh, Stormy Weber made this um, to restore missing narratives of working class activists, healers, leaders, witnesses, and ancestors lost to the AIDS crisis. Um, it really brings focus and highlight to Black people and um, uh, Black women uh, who uh, were affected and, and often were some of the, the uh, strongest advocates um, for, for helping folks uh, through the crisis. So let's go, yep, uh, one, next slide, please. There's four artworks, that's the first. The second is Christopher Jordan's um, And I'm Gonna Miss Everybody, which is a um, a speaker made of speaker forms, which is real connection to the social spaces where people were learning about HIV and also caring for each other. Um, it's, uh, it's a positive sign uh, shifted on its axis to make an HIV X, um, which really is this uh, idea of connecting the communities and not keeping folks you know, uh, separate HIV positive and negative, but to really bring them together and the, to acknowledge the reality that if one person is uh, infected, then we're all infected and need to respond to HIV and AIDS. Next slide, please. Uh, Civilization did these pieces called We're Already Here. They're um, sculptures shaped as protest signs that um, carry messages that were, were in actual demonstrations through the 80s and 90s. And um, you know messages that were really important then are still relevant today um, and connect with a lot with this region's uh, uh, broader uh, history with um, social um, change and um, uh, community actions. Uh, so, and these are set throughout the area, so they're kind of a visual and, and, and uh, conceptual connection through the other pieces. And then uh, next slide, please. 
The final piece is Ribbon of Light that's still being constructed. We're almost there, it's almost done, um, but there'll be illuminated glass pieces within the northeast corner of the park and um, they're, they're more reflective and there's words inscribed in each of these glass pieces to help people sort of connect to, to uh, their, their, uh, their feelings in, in history. Um, next slide, I think there's just two more. Uh, to share stories, obviously, forums like this are really helpful, um, but we've also gone through and um, interviewed dozens of folks, um, and those those videos are on our website um, and bring highlight to um, uh, folks and communities and histories that, that aren't, aren't often told. So there's a lot of um, videos there you can uh, view on, on the AMP website. The next slide. The other thing that's almost done, you can download the app now, but we have an app so that um, there'll be a, an actual tour that will kind of take you through this area with, with information and history. There'll be interactive elements um, with the artworks and there will even be a names tree. So like um, uh, a tree that will have uh, sort of elements that kind of leaves that fall off and, and float to the sky as, as names are read to kind of remind us of, of all the folks that have been lost to HIV and AIDS. But there, this you can download it now. There's some very basic uh, interactions. And then in a month, there's going to be a lot more interactivity and information on, on the AMP uh, app. Uh, and then I, one, is there one more slide? I think that's the end. Oh, so yes. Yeah, so we created the community group came together to create this memorial. Um, and then we planned to pass this on to an organization that could really maintain it and, and continue it into perpetuity. And so Gay City is that organization. And so now Gay City has really taken that on. The physical artworks are owned by the city of Seattle. They're in the permanent artwork collection. And Gay City's um, the entity that'll be ensuring that the website and the app and events like World AIDS Day will happen on site. Um, I think there's one more slide. Yeah, that's it. So the amp.org is our is the website. You can access all this information. Um, there's uh, a Facebook and Instagram page as well. And the YouTube channel has uh, more of the videos, which are actually hosted on the website, but you can view them there as well. That's it. All right. Oh, Fred, did you have one more thing to say? Go for it. Okay. <laughs> um, thank you so much. That was um, Pat and Jason and Fred, all of that, your stories and um, learning about um, the, the AMP and um, everything that's going on with there. I feel like there's a lot of um, really rich stuff. I see people in the conversation saying, oh, I got to schedule my trip up to Capitol Hill. So um, I really appreciate that. Okay. Oh, I'm in the dark here now. Welcome back, everyone. Um, we are going to get started with our Q&A with our presenters. So remember that you can add questions in the Q&A feature um, at the bottom of the screen. And Bob and I will be asking some questions. Um, I have one to start us off with while um, we are waiting for some questions to come in. I'm really curious, Jason, as you were sharing about the um, artwork that is in the um, Memorial Pathways, how was the, how were the art pieces and the artists selected and decided on um, for the final product? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Yeah, I kind of ran through quickly there uh, and didn't get to talk about that. Um, the uh, so uh, the one of the the really great things about the the project that was was really good foresight was um, creating a master art plan. So kind of going into the project and knowing that we needed sort of sort of a cohesive uh, uh, vision. And so uh, the first uh, uh, artist brought on was Horatio Law. Um, there was a, um, a, a call to, to select a, um, uh, a lead artist to do the master art plan. Uh, we worked in conjunction. We also connected with the Office of Arts and Culture. So we had support from them and, and a system in place to do that. So, uh, so Horatio came on board, um, looked at the opportunities, the, the physical spaces that were available um, for artwork. Uh, identified those in the plan, and then talked about the general themes that that the, the project wanted to to address as well. And so that plan, that was an 80-page plan, um, uh, multi, uh, identified like six or seven different areas 
um, and in and issues, different issues and orgs. He did a lot of interviews with folks um, connected to the history of HIV and AIDS, different organizations. Um, so that coalesced into four our opportunities. So we um, knew that we wanted to do something within the community room space, something on the plaza, something that would connect both those spaces and then something in the park. Um, the, uh, we convened four different uh, selection panels um, we knew that each one, uh, and so we identified not only where those, those artworks would be, but also what emotional um, aspects we wanted them to, to relate to. So in the plaza, of course, we wanted, um, uh, you know, we, we realized that being in this very uh, populous area, um, uh, the, we, the plaza is where the farmer's market is. It's the, out front of people's doorsteps. A lot of people live in those apartments. And so the artwork, we didn't want something to be, you know, aggressively depressing or, or tragic um, in, in that sort of space. So um, we knew that we wanted th those artworks to really connect to the history of activism and also um, celebrating you know, life and what people, creativity that people brought to, to, to the world. Um, and, and then in the park where there was a quieter and more, you know, a, 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 an area where people could be more reflective and, um, and grieve, that would be a better place for those, those artworks. So knowing the, the our opportunities, we called them the centerpiece, the connecting artworks, the park artworks, and um, the community room, uh, we went through the selection process. And um, we were fortunate to have folks that were really more or less local to the region. Um, we did do some national calls, but it became clear pretty early on that we wanted people that that had direct connections um, to to this this area. Um, and so Horatio, being the lead artist, was able to select an opportunity to um, to do. Uh, and so he uh, was uh, commissioned to do the um, the park artworks. And the more quiet and reflective um, aspect. Um, Christopher Paul Jordan, um, who is a young queer artist of color uh, based in Tacoma, who's now actually um, at uh, in Connecticut at the uh, Yale uh, Masters, uh, getting his master's at Yale School of Art, um, did the centerpiece um, artwork. Um, uh, Stormy Weber was selected to do the community room artwork, um, which, which is all those portraits that we, we, we talked about. And then um, uh, Civilization did the connecting artworks. So they were given a broad um, uh, parameters to work with. And then they really, the artists themselves, with support from the community group, um, focused those in so that we knew that we could touch on um, the, a variety of issues that were important. Great, thank you very much. I have a question as well. I have a question related to HIV for any of the panelists. One of the most tragic challenges in the HIV response has remained unchanged for decades, and that is that HIV disproportionately affects people in vulnerable populations that are often highly marginalized and stigmatized. How can we better support those populations? The word that comes to me is vote. <laughs> is that that we have become more involved on a on a larger scale? Um, I work with women across the country who, and certainly, um, women of color in the South, and certainly trans women all over the U.S. Um, have been disproportionately affected by HIV. And what we do at Positive Women's Network is we do voter registrations and, you know, and we have different different um, chapters in different cities and we phone bank nationally. So I, I think become more involved in your, your, your political spectrum and vote, vote, vote. Yeah, I, you know, just to add on to that, I, I totally agree with you, Pat. And then also, even in places like Washington State, where we are relatively progressive, um, we still have significant problems. I was on a call last night about um, the way that, that uh, insurance works in Washington State. And essentially, if you uh, have Medicaid, so if you are poor and have Apple Health, 
uh, your options for treatment for HIV are different than somebody who has private health insurance. And so even in a, a state like Washington, where you have a relatively progressive legislature, relatively progressive um, uh, you know, governor, we still have these problems that are inherently linked to capitalism, um, where uh, with Medicaid, um, you, know, you have to fail with one drug regimen that's cheaper before you're allowed to use the more expensive drugs. And so something like that is just, you know, absolutely ridiculous. Um, and I think it's a reflection on uh, kind of even in places like Washington, where you have people who are, you know, aware of uh, kind of the complexities, uh, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, and that's the other piece that I would just add to it is um, there is you know, tremendous complexity. You know, people have very complex lives. And so HIV isn't the only thing that they're dealing with. And um, uh, so you have to really think about how do you provide care that is accessible? How do you make sure that people can get there? Um, how do you make sure that people have childcare if they need it? How do you make sure that the providers are able to receive them with dignity if somebody is undocumented or if somebody, you know, how do they get care? How do they get access to health insurance? How do they get access to the things that they need? Um, uh, if you're trans, you know, are you also being able to see a provider who can uh, provide the gender care that you're looking for? And is that going to be a priority over your HIV care? So, I mean, it's very, very complicated. And I think the, the big thing is just trying to figure out what are the barriers between somebody being able to access the healthcare they need? Um, and, uh, and how do you, how do we as a society, and then how do you as a service provider, um, uh, break those barriers down and try to make, make it as easy as possible for people to get the support they need. Thank you, Pat and Fred. Um, we do have a question in the Q and A, um, and I'm gonna kind of add on to it. The question is, um, can HIV and AIDS be cured? Um, and I'm just interested if, if you might be able to share, anyone might be able to share a little bit of sort of insight into kind of current state of research and development and, and that those sorts of things. Do you wanna take that, Pat, or? Do well, I'll, I'll start, you can wrap it up. Actually, HIV has been cured in a couple of people. Uh, first person was Timothy Ray Brown, and uh, he was known as the Berlin patient. And it was a very, uh, it was dangerous, it was risky, it was a um, procedure that would not be recommended or at all for general population of people with HIV. Um, I, I get involved sometimes with the, uh, the ACTU, the AIDS Clinical Trial Unit. And um, there, there are definitely trials going on. I, we, we have a impractical cure for AIDS, um, but the big thing that it showed is that it can happen. So that really was a big boost. And the, the other person is, uh, I believe he's from England. Anyway, he was, I met him on a call before, but, um, there's, I don't know, we've, we've been, we've been looking for, you know, for so long. So um, Michael Luella is the person to talk to about that. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I think that you, the, the miraculous thing about uh, treatment right now is that, you know, there is kind of this functional cure in as much as right. people are able to be, um, successful on treatment. And so provided someone is able to get access to medication and take that medication, and it's easier and easier for people to take a medication from, for most folks, it's one pill a day. Um, uh, and there are new injectables coming out where you can um, get an injection, I believe it's uh, for a month um, or uh, that, that people are working towards. So there is now really good hope for those who have access to treatment that they can get uh, treatment. The other kind of really remarkable thing about the treatment is it it makes you not infectious. And so historically, um, even when people were on treatment successfully, uh, there wasn't the the you didn't get the virus to the level that the current medications can get it to, which is undetectable. So what that means is 
as long as you stay on your medication successfully and you don't have any other mitigating factors that are gonna make your viral load pop up, um, you are no longer able to pass HIV on yeah. to someone else if you have uh, if you have HIV and you're successfully on treatment, which is, I mean, which is a breakthrough, um, both in terms of preventing HIV, but also preventing the stigma that so many people with HIV live with, which is this notion that there's somehow this vector of disease and that defines them. Um, and so I think it's, you know, that's remarkable. The other thing that we have is HIV medications that people who are not infected with HIV can take every day. That's called PrEP or pre-exposure prophylaxis. And you basically take two HIV medications in one pill, take it every day. And then if you're exposed to HIV, you don't actually get infected. And so that's the other kind of remarkable thing um, with, with treatment nowadays. There's been vaccine research for decades. Uh, we still have no, no vaccine that's been effective. Um, but you know, I think there's a lot of hope in a vaccine and there's, there's a lot of uh, cure research happening and a hope for a cure that's more, um, you know, that, that actually we could use in a widespread way. And, and both of those efforts are, a lot of that is happening in Seattle at Fred Hutch. Um, yeah. A lot of that, that research is happening right here. And so there's great ways to learn more about it. Yeah. And I just want to say, I put in the, a link in the chat um, to a story on the AMP website uh, with uh, Dr. Hans-Peter Kiem, who uh, yeah. is working at Fred Hutch and talks a little bit, he talks a little bit about the, um, you know, efforts to to cure HIV and gene therapies that are that are being done. Um, he, he mentions Timothy Ray Brown, which interesting fact was from Seattle, um, was treated in Berlin, but initially was a Seattleite. So yeah, it's it's been fascinating around the the, the all the connections to our region and our state as uh, you think about HIV and AIDS and the and the global impact that some of the organizations are doing too. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that I put that that link to that story if you want to learn a little bit more about that. Great. Thank you, all of you. Our next question. HIV and AIDS have had such a significant impact on the LGBTQ plus community. Although I often find that younger folks in the queer community, including myself, have limited knowledge about its history. In addition to AMP, what are ways you all think we can continue to keep the conversation going and honor the memory of those we lost? Um, I'll jump in and say, uh, I think that uh, media is, is a real uh, important way to do that. And I think that, um, the, the diversifying media is a, is a really, uh, is, is an important recent development in that. So, um, so we, you know, the AMP is, was created and, and as I mentioned before, is in a very visible location because we really want it to, to be, um, uh, sig you know, a significant reminder for folks so that it's something that can't just easily be uh, avoided and pushed aside. And so um, these memorials, that we're not the only city that has an AIDS memorial. Um, there's a new one being created in West Hollywood. There's a longstanding one in, um, in Los Angeles, uh, in Echo Park. Most, uh, many major cities um, have an AIDS memorial. Um, of course, San Francisco is the National AIDS Memorial. Um, so, so those physical things uh, are very important. I think that um, uh, television series uh, like uh, It's a Sin, which was on um, uh, HBO and um, Pose, of course, is a, is a, has been a real oh, important yeah. series for, for folks, for younger folks especially, to have a, a, an understanding and a touchstone around the history of HIV and AIDS. So those those television shows and those um, those films, I think that have that have been created in the past, but then also um, are currently are coming out now. I think continuing to to create that content and have folks, um, you know, come at it from different perspectives too, right? Like the the angle that Pose has on presenting communities that have been overlooked um, in the history of HIV and AIDS and in, in, in popular media um, is important. And it's, it's, it's a unique um, uh, community that was you know, seen, um, you know, not, it's not just about HIV and AIDS, but it has that important element within it. Um, so there's many other issues that it talks about the intersectionality, I think of all the, of uh, the history of HIV and AIDS, that it's not just one thing that it's, that it's affected many people and in many communities. And, and I think that's what we, 
we need to support. So, so yeah, so finding those, those films and TV shows and, and sharing them with folks and preventing, uh, presenting forums like this where um, people can do presentations and, and talk about that or even just do a screening, I think is, is really important. I guess the only, the only thing I would uh, encourage people, uh, World AIDS Day is December 1st. And mm -hmm. so this year we'll be having um, a presentation at the AMP. Uh, so right there by the Capitol Hill Lights, uh, Light Rail Station, that's a lot of words. Um, uh, at four o'clock in the afternoon on uh, December 1st, we're gonna have a couple of poets um, uh, reading some of their, uh, their poetry about their experiences with HIV and AIDS. And I think, you know, art in general is a great way um, when before COVID we had a performing arts season um, and uh, one of the shows that, that we did um, was specifically about the experience of, uh, of black folks in Seattle, black queer and trans folks in Seattle and their experiences with HIV and AIDS. And we'll continue, you know, once things open back up again, you know, I'm gonna cross my fingers, uh, you know, we'll continue to uh, bring together stories um, and and local artists that have uh, perspectives and uh, and stories to tell. So that's another way. Um, most of that, most of those uh, presentations are are going virtual, and so we will be doing another art season this year, but it'll be online. So I'll also make sure and pass that um, information on when that happens. And almost always, there's some story or um, or narrative related to HIV and AIDS is such an important part of our history. Um, also on World AIDS Day, there will be a, um, an exhibition. They, it, it's not at the Bill and Melinda Gates Center, unfortunately, because they're closed because of COVID, but a program I've been involved with is, is called Through Positive Eyes. And it was a, it, a group of like a dozen people from Seattle. It's been done all over the world in different cities. Um, and we basically were given cameras and told to go out and tell our story. And um, so we have stories and pictures and it's a pretty, it, it, we're all gonna, we're actually all gonna participate in that. Um, and so that will be World AIDS Day and it is virtual and it's through positive eyes. And I will send links out. Thank you so much. Those are really great resources. Um, I think that we have covered all the questions that we've gotten. So before we wrap up, I just wanted to offer a chance if any of our panelists, um, if you had any things that we missed that you wanted to make sure that you um, shared with our community before we wrap up. Uh, I, I think that, that um, I, that's good. I'm sorry, I'm putting in the link. Oh, maybe somebody else found it. I, I put in that link. Uh, Pat to uh, through positive eyes in oh, the thank chat you. because yeah I think that's really an important thing that and it's it's been unfortunate that it hasn't been uh, an in person um, mm -hmm. exhibition this year as it has been in other cities um, but uh, but the, it is online and they're they're providing uh, uh, talks with with artivists so folks who are activists and artists that can talk to to groups so you can arrange to have like a a small group uh, presentation or you can look at it online. Um, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm thrilled that the AMP uh, has come together. I, was, I, I love that it um, really was uh, intentional in, in, in wanting to provide uh, diverse perspectives, not only from the artists that, that, is, uh, um, that are um, their, their look, but also in terms of like what it's providing in terms of uh, an important history that needs to be remembered. So, uh, so yeah, so it's online, you know, through the website, you can go visit the, the, the artworks in person. Um, and I, again, I'm thrilled that the work that Fred and, and Gay City is doing um, is gonna help sustain the AMP and, uh, and you know, enhance it even more. So uh, World AIDS Day is a great opportunity to, to remind people around HIV and AIDS. So use your social media and hopefully you'll be able to go to some of these uh, events that Pat and, and Fred talked about. Yeah. We, uh, we did actually have one more question pop in. Um, sorry, I just cut you off the map, Pat, if you wanted to, <laughs> oh, that's okay. before we ask that. <laughs> Go ahead. All right, I think Bob's going to ask it. Oh, but you're muted, Bob. 
Thanks. It's a great affirming question for our panel. Um, loss and struggle are prominent parts of this history. What are some ways you all have experienced joy and pleasure in your work and lives to give you sustenance for making good trouble? <laughs> for me, it's the people, um, the, the connections. There are many laughs that happen in support groups. It's not just, and, and I mean, throughout, even in the very bad old days, um, the, the humor was dark. <laughs> continues to be dark, but um, the people and just the connections. So that has, that's definitely helped me be able to deal with, you know, my losses um, is that there's still a sense of community left and that we can, you know, we can come together at times like this, um, but the losses were, were inevitable and are inevitable because people still are dying of HIV. And uh, that's, I think that's a pretty thing, pretty important thing for people to remember. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Pat. I mean, I feel like the, every, uh, for every story of loss, there's also a story of um, people coming together, um, mm -hmm. uh, either to uh, support that person as they, um, as they leave, as they depart. Um, but there's also stories of survival. There's also stories of, you know, incredible odds that people have beat and, um, and ways that community has made an impact. Um, so, I mean, I think for me, it's really about, as you were saying, those connections, the connections to the other people um, who are equally invested and, um, uh, and who are making a difference. And, you know, that's a big thing for me. I also have too many pets. And so pets are also helpful. So. I think dogs and cats, dogs, cats, and children, they, they're, they're all uh, helpful as well. And we've got too many of them over here. <laughs> uh, yeah, I would just, uh, one thing that we talked about in the prep for this, uh, this presentation, Fred and I were discussing that uh, of, of the age that, the age of gay man that we are, uh, are, are uh, another friend had, had described as a bridge generation. And we really, um, the, the gay men just older than us were hit the, the hardest by the epidemic. Yeah. And we're completely caught off guard. And the gay men just under us um, really don't know this history. They, you know, the, and you know, not always through any fault of their own, just like, you know, it hasn't been taught in schools. It has, you know, the specifics, people know what HIV is maybe medically, but they don't know the social and, and historical impact that, that the pandemic had. And so, uh, so I think it's a, it's a responsibility that we have to help bridge that, that gap to the folks who have experienced it and the folks that don't know about it and, and really want to. Um, and so, that brings uh, that brings happiness to me to be able to bring art, um, you know, art and stories to communities and bring those communities to to art. And so I did that with uh, with the with the queer film festival and the and the the queer three dollar bill cinema, which has a, a festival coming up next week or actually starting this weekend. Um, and that those film festivals are a great way to kind of keep those stories out there and, 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 and to engage with audiences. So, so that brings joy to me, um, being able to, and, and, and with this project, being able to play a, a role in helping make it a permanent part of our city. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen families that, uh, you know, walk through that plaza and young kids ask their parents, like, what does that protest sign mean? What does silence equals death mean? And they've starting to have those conversations. And oh, that just, that makes me feel so good that, that, yeah. that, that there's that happening. I, I miss being able to go into classrooms in person and have that that face-to-face uh, -face with students. Um, and I feel like it's part of my responsibility when I go out to talk about living with HIV that there's a history lesson involved. Um, and yeah, and I, so I, I, def, I definitely miss that. Um, so maybe I'll see you in a classroom sometime soon. <laughs> or at this rate, it might be your children. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you all for sharing that. I love that we got to end a question on sort of that, um, that aspect of joy and, uh, 
Fred, I love the idea. Yes, we all have our pets. I think that's one of the, the things about Zoom is we've like started to get to see and know everybody's yes. pets in our spaces. So that's been really fun. Um, thank you all so much for being part of this. I, um, I think we, everybody mm -hmm. here learned a lot and really got to um, appreciate your stories. And so Thank you so much for um, being here. Thank you for everyone who attended as well. Um, we are approaching, I can't believe it, the end of LGBTQIA plus week, um, which will be tomorrow. We have two events to wrap things up. So um, first off, we will have um, Senator Mark Elias, who will be sharing at 11 a.m. queer politics post marriage equality. And then at three o'clock, we will finish our week with a film view viewing of Kumuhina. And um, yeah, so we hope that you can join us for both or one of those events tomorrow. And um, again, if you can share your feedback about this event um, with that link there, we really appreciate it. And it really helps um, us tell the story of the events that we're sharing. So thank you once again to our presenters, Pat, Jason, and Fred for sharing all of your time and knowledge with us today. Um, and thanks everyone. We hope you have a great day. <laughs>